Hello, it's video 14 um, that I'm doing now, uh, indirect taxes, uh, taxation and subsidies. A really interesting, vibrant and uh, exciting topic and very important as well, so you've got to learn it. So, um, indirect taxes and subsidies. We'll come to subsidies later, but let's just uh, be sure we understand the reasons why governments impose or levy taxes. These are the main reasons. To raise government revenue, after all the government has to spend a lot of money on the public sector. Um, so, to raise government revenue, to influence public spending patterns. Um, what I mean by that is the spending patterns of the public. By placing taxes on certain goods, they hope to raise the price of those goods and reduce the consumption of those goods by raising their price. Um, tobacco products, uh, alcohol are examples of where taxes are placed simply to raise the price and discourage us from, from spending our money on those goods. And thirdly, to impact income inequality. Maybe some governments will place higher tax rates on people with higher incomes uh, so that uh, it, it helps to create more equality or less inequality um, between uh, people in society. So it may be done for these reasons. And fourthly, to reduce the competitiveness of foreign goods if specific taxes are placed on imported goods, it raises their price and that reduces their competitiveness in a home domestic market. So these are possible reasons for taxes. Um, and we're only interested in looking in, at indirect taxes at the moment. So let's be sure we understand what an indirect tax is com compared to a direct tax. Indirect taxes are levied on expenditure. That means that they are charged when goods are bought. Okay, the tax is paid when the good is bought. Uh, whereas that's different to direct taxes, which are levied on the income or the profit or the wealth of people and businesses. So not at the point of, of, of exchange. We're only interested in indirect taxes, taxes that are paid when an economic transaction takes place and something is bought. Okay, so now, we subdivide indirect taxes into two types of taxes, unit and specific taxes and ad valorem taxes. Here's the definitions for these two types of indirect tax. Unit or specific tax is a fixed amount of money on types of goods regardless of their price. So if the government puts a $2 tax on all bottles of wine, whether that's a cheap bottle of wine or an expensive bottle of wine, that would be an example of a unit tax. Whereas an ad valorem tax is a fixed percentage of the value. If the government says, right, we put a 20% tax on all goods, whatever their value, then the amount of tax rises with the value of the good. And of course, the main example of such a tax is VAT. VAT, value added tax, or a sales tax, uh, is, is an example of um, an ad valorem tax. Okay, let's move on. Well, this must be important. I put it in really bright red, capital, underlined. Yes, it's very important. Indirect taxes are collected via the business selling the good, who view the tax as a rise in the cost of production. Therefore, the indirect tax reduces supply and shifts the S-curve inwards and upwards by a vertical distance equal to the, to the size of the tax. Okay? Pause your video and read that five times because it's so important. It's just so important. Let me get out of the way and you'll be able to pause. Okay, it's very, very important because this explains to us what happens in the diagram. If you're going to understand the diagram, you've got to, you've got to uh, grasp this concept. The tax acts on the business, therefore it acts like a cost of production, therefore it affects the supply curve, not the demand curve. It shifts the supply curve inwards, and the, um, and the distance it shifts it is equal to the, to the tax itself. Let's explore this on some diagrams. So here I'm going to show you the effect of a unit or specific tax. At the moment we're in equilibrium, there is no tax, price is P1, quantity is Q1. But the tax imposed would do this.
shift the supply curve by a vertical distance equal to the tax. That is the tax. The vertical distance between the supply curves. The vertical distance is the same with the unit tax. Those lines are parallel. It's a parallel shift of the supply curve. And it is so because the tax is the same, whatever the price, with a unit tax. Now look at this. There is the price, the new price, following the tax. There is the new quantity following the tax. What has the tax done? It's raised price and it's reduced the quantity being bought. But look, at that new equilibrium point, the vertical distance between the supply curves, which is the tax, the vertical distance between the supply curves is more than the rise in the price. That distance, which is the tax, is more than the rise in the price. So clearly, not all of the tax is being passed on to the consumers as a price rise. Some of the tax is still being paid by the producer. They have not been able to throw all of the burden of the tax over to the consumers as a price rise. In fact, if that is the tax per unit, and this is the amount now being sold, the tax per unit multiplied by the quantity being sold is the entire tax revenue for the government. But the consumers are only praying, have only seen a rise in price of P1 to P2. So this is what the consumers are paying. The rest is being paid by producers. Together is the entire tax revenue for the government. Partly paid by consumers, partly paid by producers. Let's progress and look at an ad valorem tax. Now, the effect of an ad valorem tax. Um, an ad valorem tax does not lead to a parallel shift in the, in the, in the supply curve, but a non-parallel shift in the supply curve. S2 is a non-parallel shift of the supply curve, as you can see. Um, the reason is that the vertical distance is still the tax, but the vertical distance grows as the price grows. At lower prices, the tax is smaller. At higher prices, the tax is more. But the proportional, the ratio between tax and price, tax and price, remains the same. That's an ad valorem tax. Apart from that, everything else is the same. Look, there's the new equilibrium point. There's the new price. There's the new quantity. If I look at the equilibrium point, the vertical distance between the supply curves is the tax per unit, multiplied by the quantity now being sold, and that gives me the tax revenue for the government. But it's not all paid by one group. The consumers pay the price rise, the rest is paid by the producers. Okay, so once you've got over the idea that the supply curve shifts in a slightly different way for ad valorem taxes than for unit taxes, everything else, the analysis of what's happening after that, remains the same for the two types of taxes. Okay. I suppose I could explore the removal of a unit tax. Of course, if there is a tax already and it gets removed, then the supply curve will shift downwards. No tax. And that, of course, raises the quantity and it reduces the price. So we don't only have to talk about levying taxes, we can talk about the removal or the reduction of a tax as well, which shifts the supply curve in the other way, of course. Right. So who pays the greatest burden of tax? The incidence of tax will fall most heavily on consumers if the PED, if the elasticity of demand, is less than the elasticity of supply. But the incidence of tax falls mostly on the supplier if the elasticity of demand is greater than elasticity of supply. It's kind of like a battle between the two elasticities. The consumers demand elasticity or the producers supply elasticity. And whichever elasticity is more elastic, that group pays less tax than the other group. Is that confusing? Let's have a look at it. Here we have a diagram. The elasticity of demand is pretty elastic and the demand and the supply is pretty inelastic. I suspect that this is going to be an example of this one. 
where we're going to see mostly the supplier pays the tax because the elasticity of demand is greater than the elasticity of supply. But let's explore it. Let's imagine a tax gets imposed. I'll make it a unit tax. There it is, there's the unit tax. Okay, the price rises very slightly, P2. The quantity falls to there, Q2. I look at the uh, equilibrium point, I look at the distance between the supply curves. That tells me the whole of the revenue for the government. The consumers are paying a tiny bit, the producers are paying all of that. Clearly it fell mostly on the producers. This is an example of the reverse. This will be an example of that one. Because the demand is inelastic and the supply is more elastic, so let's explore it. Let's impose a tax, S2, there's the new equilibrium point, price P2, quantity Q2. Well. There's the vertical distance between the supply curves, as measured from the new equilibrium point. There is the revenue for the government. Most of it is paid by the consumer, a little bit by the producer. Clearly, uh, the consumer pays most of the tax, and that's because the demand was less, less elastic than the supply. And most of the tax was able to be passed on by the supplier to the consumer as a price rise. Just to be sure that you know how to do that, Look at this. This is, how you, this is how you go through it on a diagram. First, find the new equilibrium point once you've imposed the tax. Secondly, at this new equilibrium point, find the vertical distance between the supply curves. That is the tax per unit. Maybe that's what you have to find in, an, in a question. It's the vertical distance between the supply curves at the new equilibrium point. Thirdly, multiply this tax per unit by the new quantity being bought and sold. This is the entire tax revenue for the government. And then how do you split between consumers and producers? Well, remember, the consumers always pay the price change, the difference between the old and the new price. The remainder is paid by the producers. I'm going to take these words and I'm going to squash them to one side of the page. There, same words, but let's explore this now. So, very, very straightforward. Here we go. There's a demand curve. There's a supply curve. There's the initial price and quantity. A tax is imposed. S2. Find the new, and, and I can put in straight away, the new price and the new quantity. Right. Switching colours. Find the new equilibrium point. That's here. At this point, find the vertical distance between the S curves. That's the tax per unit. There's I'm on this S-curve, there's, the there's the distance between the S-curves, okay? Between that curve and that curve. That is the tax per unit. The vertical distance between the supply curves is the tax per unit. Number three, multiply this tax per unit by the new quantity being sold. Well, the new quantity being sold is Q2, so there. So that tells me, it's the tax per unit times the quantity being sold, that is the entire tax revenue. Four, consumers always pay, pay the price change, old to new price. So that's the consumer's portion or burden of the tax. And so the rest is paid by the producers. That's the way to do it. Okay? Extreme cases. Consumers may pay all the tax. In the extreme case of price elasticity of demand being perfectly inelastic, or price elasticity of supply being perfectly elastic. I can show you that. It, it doesn't happen in reality, but uh, theoretically it's possible, and you might get examined on it. So let me show you when PED is zero, PED looks like this. There's the demand. And there's a supply curve, S. OK, here we are. There's price, P1, quantity, Q1. If, um, if, a, if a tax is now imposed, S2, uh, then you know the price rises to there. The quantity stays at Q1. We go to the new equilibrium point. The vertical distance between the supply curves is the tax per unit. Okay, and that's the tax revenue for the government. And it is entirely a rise in price. The consumers are paying it all. There's no portion for the producers. Okay. Or the other um, way that the consumers may end up paying all of this, uh, all of this tax is slow then, sorry, is if 
uh, PES is infinite. So if the S curve is like this, and the demand curve is here, and there's the equilibrium quantity in price, now if there's a tax, the S curve shifts to S2, there's the new equilibrium point, Q2, that's P2. We go to the new equilibrium point. We look at the vertical distance between the supply curves times the new quantity. That's the tax revenue for the government. And it's all paid by the consumers because the whole thing is a price rise. Okay, so these are the two examples where the consumers pay everything. But there are also, uh, there's also the possibility that the producers pay everything. Producers pay everything. The producers pay everything when the reverse is true. PED is infert, or PES equals uh, zero. So when PED, so first of all, when PED is infinite, when the demand curve is like that, there's the S curve, there's the equilibrium quantity price. A new uh, attacks will do this. There's the new equilibrium point. You can see the price has not changed. The consumers are not being burdened with any of the tax. And uh, there's the vertical distance between the supply curves. That's the tax revenue for the government. There's no change in price. The producers must be paying all of it. OK, so these are the extremes. There is one more extreme, which is a, the weirdest one of all. And It's this. Very strange when PES is zero. So if the supply curve is vertical and the demand curve is here, there's the equilibrium point P1, Q1. Now, this is weird because to impose a tax now, I have to shift the supply curve upwards. But we can't see that because it shifts up upon itself. I'll kind of draw it like this. The supply curve might look like this. The equilibrium point is still here, the price is still P1, but if I want to look now, I need to look at the shift in the S-curve, and, um, you know, that can't really show that very easily, but the, uh, there is the new equilibrium point, I would go to the old supply curve, uh, I can't really show that, but, um, you know, it's like this, uh, no, it's not, it's like this, yeah. So anyway, it's an extreme case, and uh, it's unlikely to happen that the PES is completely inelastic. So that's that's that. There's, these extreme cases don't really happen. Now, when we, well, let's let's switch to subsidies now. Subsidies, money given to producers. It's the reverse, like a negative tax in a way. Uh, money is given by the government to producers, either to encourage production uh, with the aim of supporting producers, or to encourage consumers to consume more of a good. Uh, you might be grumbling, if you're European and you're aiming for a British university, you might be grumbling about having to pay £9,000 in fees every year to a university, but in fact, it's subsidised. And if you were non-European, you'd know that you've got to pay much more than that. So um, that's with the purpose of encouraging more people to go to university. Um, and the subsidy acts as a fall in the production costs. So it increases supply, shifting the S-curve outwards and downwards. We can show that on a diagram. So let's show the effect of a subsidy. It shifts the S-curve outwards and downwards. Increasing output, that was the objective. Lowering price, there's the new equilibrium point there. Now, who gets the subsidy? Not all of the subsidies passed on to the consumers as a price fall. In fact, uh, how much of it is depends again upon the relative elasticities. But, but the great thing is you analyze this in precisely the same way as you analyze the tax. You go to the new equilibrium point. You look for the vertical distance between the supply curves. Of course, now you're looking upwards for the old supply curve. And that's there. That is the subsidy per unit. Multiply it by the number of goods being produced, and that's now that much. So that is the cost of the subsidy to the government. The cost of the subsidy to the government. But how much of that subsidy was given to the consumers, well, that's 
this area because it's the change in the price. And the rest is given to the producers. So the consumers get the fall in price, the rest was absorbed, the rest of the subsidy was kept by the producers. Okay? So this idea of going to the new equilibrium point, let me go back to that. This idea of going to the new equilibrium point, okay, it works for subsidies too. Find the vertical distance between the S curves, that is the subsidy. The subsidy per unit. Multiply this subsidy per unit by the new quantity being sold, that is the entire cost of subsidy to government. Consumers always pay the price change, always get the price for, and the remainder is kept by the producers. Get the idea? If you learn this, you can apply it to both tax and uh, subsidies. Okay? Well, I hope I explained that. Uh, felt like I rushed it a bit, but uh, um, anyway, important topic, a little bit dull, but never mind does come up on exams an awful lot um, <clears throat> and of course actually you know and we'll look at this when we do market failure the effectiveness of tax depends upon who ends up paying the tax doesn't it you know when a, when a tax is placed on cigarettes with the objective of reducing the number of smokers by making the price go up if the demand is very inelastic it's not going to most of the tax will end up being paid by the, the consumers and they'll carry on uh, buying almost as much as before. It won't reduce the quantity demanded very much. So issues about the effectiveness of taxation arise later uh, and, and when we do um, market failure. But that's enough for now. Okay? Thank you. Bye-bye.